Okay, so I'll go ahead and call the subcommittee meeting to order. Um, and the first thing I want to do is to announce to the public that um, we'd like to make these as participatory as possible. Bear with us. We're still trying to figure out how to do these subcommittee meetings via Zoom. And so um, please, um, we, we, like, um, we like participation. We want to hear from you um, rather than having it. Um, I don't think we have the technical uh, ability to just kind of make it open to just have people speak when they want to speak. So periodically, we'll be pausing and asking people to put their hands up so that Aaron can call on you uh, so you can ask a question. Uh, with that said, uh, Ridge, is there anything else you uh, want to go over before we jump into it? Nope, let's just jump into it. Thanks. So our, our topic today, our purpose is to review the draft of the HR advisors um, uh, housing strategy. Um, um, I hope people have had a chance to have a look at that. We did receive a number of comments. Um, Sunshine and Chris, uh, I had your comments and so I was prepared to read them onto the, into the record. Um, but um, now that you're here, uh, I'll, um, I'll refrain from that unless you have to disappear, in which case I will. Uh, so to let people know, we had had an uh, opportunity for subcommittee members to, um, to make comments. Uh, I got comments back from three subcommittee members, two of whom are here, so uh, we will let them speak for themselves. Um, uh, I think our remit today is to look at this and if possible, uh, I don't know that we're going to be able to wordsmith live on Zoom, but um, to get some general notes uh, regarding if we can come to some consensus around a specific recommendations to the draft proposal that we can then send uh, Aaron, are we sending these directly to council or are we sending these to the um, consultants? I was a little confused about that. I am not sure. Maybe Brenda or Alex might know. I would suggest sending them directly to Alex and Missy, whatever comments you have. Is that okay, Alex? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so most likely what will happen is that we'll we'll take some notes um, we'll try to get consensus. It'll take a take a few days to to clean up the notes, put them in a presentable form, recirculate them among committee members, and then um, get them to staff. Phil, does that sound like an okay plan to you? Yeah, I mean we're we're constrained by the calendar here. The goal being to get this uh, something woodshedded pretty quickly and out there um, so that it can at least be there for the 1110 work session. 1110. Okay. So we have um, no uh, time at all. We <laughs> have six days. Well, right. We'll just, uh, we'll do the best that we can. It's a, it's a detailed, uh, long document um, and we'll do the best we can to comment as well as we can. Uh, before I get started on that though, I do want to um, um, note a couple things that are fairly obvious is that I think Probably people are feeling a lot of different things today. Um, tired, weary, perhaps excited, um, happy. Uh, I want to put aside the politics of the day to focus on our solemn task, which is to review and make recommendations to make this draft housing policy the best it can be. This is a really great opportunity. I think we're all really deeply connected, no matter what our political affiliations are, by the um, by the intense desire to make this a more equitable community. Um, um, uh, this global pandemic has absolutely shown the disproportionate impact uh, of bad housing on, on low wealth families. And I think we all want to reaffirm our right, our, our belief in housing as a basic human right. So I'm asking for everybody to, um, um, uh, to bring with them a special, a special amount of grace today. Um, uh, forgive me for, um, um, tripping over my words and forgive other folks for um, if they haven't had full attention for this, we're going to do the best that we can. Um, to that end, uh, before we sort of jump in and give an overview of how we're going to do the meeting, I do want to give um, folks who did comment an opportunity to, uh, to share their comments. And I will read the comments from one committee member, Frank Stoner, who isn't here. So Sunshine, I'd like to recognize you to, um, if you're ready to, to give your perspective, your overall perspective. Yeah, I, actually, I want a point of clarification initially, because um, 
when we when this meeting was scheduled and correct me if my understanding is incorrect here uh, but when this meeting is scheduled we had one document to review which was essentially the overarching guidelines around the affordable housing plan and then two days ago the draft affordable housing plan became public and so my initial comments were more focused on the previous documents gotcha. um, and so, you know, I did just scrub through as best I could this morning through the draft affordable housing plan, which I do think clarifies a lot of the, the questions that I and I know others have had as well. Um, but I just want to clarify for this meeting's purpose, our, our, is, our, is our focus on the, the draft affordable housing plan as it was released two days ago? Just to make sure we focus our comments appropriately. I, I think so, but let me refer, let me defer that to Phil. You're on mute, Phil. Yeah. So this, yeah. So the draft, uh, the draft was released last night, essentially uh, late yesterday afternoon. So um, I, you know, the timing of all of this is not exactly ideal. I think we have the data in front of us. We evaluate what we can and give the recommendations based on what we believe to be the target discussion on eleven ten and roll with it. Um, I mean, I'm not really sure how fine a distinction we can make at this point. Um, and it may be that we just sort of, uh, that a lot of the work of these recommendations is gonna be sort of a second round of, of notes and communication sent to the chairs so that they can sort of compose uh, a synthesis. Okay. Does that answer the question asked? I think it kind of does. Um, um, and and while I've got the while I've got a piece of the floor, and if you want to sort of have me take another swing of it, um, Joe and or Aaron S. Lisa is knocking on the door trying to get in here. Uh, and considering she sits on the steering committee, it would be great to have her. So whatever buttons we need to push, could somebody do that for S. Lisa Herndon? All right. Housekeeping out of the way. All right. You want me to take another swing at that? No, no. I think I can run with that. Um, um, you know, we have the we have the the plan. It's been published. It's it's a matter of public record at this point. So, my sense is that we should probably look at the plan, not on not the present. We should be focusing on the plan, not the presentation. Um, with that said, Chris, um, did were you, were your comments relative to the plan or to the presentation? Sorry. Uh... I think to the presentation, and I honestly haven't been through the, the plan, which, but it's, it's unclear to me, there was like 133 page PowerPoint, which was the plan or the, or slash presentation and is the new draft or, <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I think I, I offered some observations. I'm, I'm just moving a little bit confused. I will offer those observations during our conversation. So I don't know if that community did. Again, I need to dive into everything because I'm, I'm a little bit confused where we're at, so. Okay, Thanks. well, so I, I do then want to, thank you, Chris. I do want to read Frank Stoner, who's a member of the committee, his uh, comments on the plan, not on the presentation. And I quote, he said, inclusionary zoning and city funding needs to encourage small entrepreneurial businesses in appropriate locations that can be a step on the ladder out of poverty and help build generational wealth. Number two, he said, meaningful employment opportunities are not a direct policy objective of the housing plan, but they should acknowledge as a high priority for the city uh, as part of the plan and funded appropriately. Without economic opportunity, affordable housing will become permanent housing for lower income residents and will never break the cycle of generational poverty. Um, with that said, uh, the, the plan is multifaceted in multiple chapters. What I thought we would do is, is go around among, a steer, among committee members and do a sort of speed round um, because there's no way that in an hour and a half, two hours, we're going to get to everything. And I want to see if there's consensus around certain components of it that we want to spend uh, time doing a deeper dive on. Um, so uh, if anyone wants to start, feel free to raise your hand. If not, I will call on people in a round robin fashion. Does anybody want to kick us off? All right, Chris, please. Um, I had two general comments that I was not, <clears throat> unable to send beforehand, and the one is the is the concept that doesn't seem to exist in this is that um, the, the supply and demand element that is 
uh, not acknowledged is the cost of land or land itself, the availability of land. And um, that, that, that I didn't see anything that would address that specifically in terms of a land trust, land bank. It was land bank was mentioned, but land trusts were not <clears throat> as a yeah. solution. And then the other piece that, um, you know, speaking from a developer standpoint, is that um, one of the one of the biggest issues in the cost of housing is carrying cost. Um, so if a developer buys the land for a million bucks, if he can get it, he, she, if the entity can get it uh, entitled uh, within two months, carrying costs are negligible. If it takes two years, the carrying costs can be a, a significant um, addition to the, that has to be passed on to the, to the um, in rents the price of the housing, whatever. So that it's, it's a, it pains me because all of, these, all of these issues having to do with equity, with racial justice, all of these are huge. Okay. And the real world reality is that the carrying costs will be increased. All right, so Chris, I hate to be a miser, uh, but I wanna be sort of clear about what I'm trying to do here is just, a, this is sort of a speed round. I should have said, I should have given people like 30 seconds. But what I flagged for two things, cost of land and carrying costs due to the, the time lag of entitlement. That's good. That, okay. Um, so all we're trying to do is flag what are the topics that we want to talk about, and then we'll take a deeper dive on the ones where there's consensus that we want to talk about. So sorry to interrupt you. I wasn't clear about no the direction. No problem. Um, just in, in order, Ridge, do you want to go next? Oh, God, a speed round for me? Um, <laughs> So one is the, the plan asserts that it is comprehensive, but it does not address um, the second element that is critical for affordable housing. It's not just the cost of housing, but it's the amount of income that you have to afford that housing. And besides one throwaway sentence, there was no focus on economic opportunity and helping people earn more income. So that's number one. Um, I think it's a major deficit in the report. Number two is um, while uh, I, I, I definitely support the, uh, the focus on home ownership and I would like to see a little bit more on the shared equity model of, of helping people build wealth. Um, so those are the, the two things that I would say. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sunshine, you're next on my, uh, my Brady Bunch list. Uh, I, I honestly don't know how to keep it short, um, but I will try. Um, so I, I agree that there is opportunity for more fleshing out of the uh, shared equity models, whether it's community land trust or otherwise. There is, Chris, there is some reference just as a clarification on pages 112 through 114. There's some reference to the CLP there. Um, um, I, I, overall, I, I guess one, well, you want to keep it to a bullet point, sorry. Um, I guess one uh, one piece is that um, the the document does a good job of highlighting CRHA and public housing redevelopment, but does not once mention Friendship Court redevelopment, and I think that's a a, a gap. Um, I would like to get into a little bit on the the, the proposed ten million dollars a year um, because. I think there are some nuances to that number that we want to flesh out and make sure we're all clear on. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. S. Lisa, are there a, a couple of items that you'd like to flag uh, for us to dig into? Oh, and you're muted. I'm sorry, I'm having some there technical difficulties here. My neighbor is putting on a new roof and it's affecting my internet. Um, it's crazy. And my children are being homeschooled as well. Um, just more focus on the um, home ownership aspect of it. Um, I have notes and I have to find them. Um, I want to dig more into that part of it. And I know we got to be brief. Thank you, Lisa. Chris, uh, are there particular components you want us to dig into or focus our attention on? It's Chris Meyer. Um, yeah, I was a little concerned when I saw a lot of new suggestions on regulations of, of landlords and rental properties, uh, including uh, 
a, a, a cap on, on rentals or uh, again, regulated rental prices and other things. Um, I did like though that they were sorry, talking about helping tenants engage in those processes and reducing resources to that. I also, there was a previous comment, and sorry, I don't know where it's at or observation, I think in the document about, I think building wealth, and, but we don't want gentrification. And so there was a bit of a conflict, I thought, you know, potentially there uh, and, and wanted to un potentially unpack that if people thought it was an issue. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, uh, Phil? A uh, couple things and I'll try to bullet point them um, in um, to begin with uh, circling back to Sunshine's comment on the 10 million a year and um, how we sort of manage that and implement that. I would suggest that that's an opportunity to us for to plop that number into the IAT and uh, see if we can synthesize that to get some more granular detail of how that gets in, uh, what the impacts might be. Uh, two is that on some of the implementation pieces that we take a, a dive into the recommendation and then how best to implement, uh, some of that has to do with, uh, uh, one thing I noted had to do with the shared equity piece and some of the models that they use. Um, and the third is that there is a couple of pieces of low, uh, low hanging fruit. Um, the land bank, uh, although it did run into trouble at its initial council meeting. We do have, as low-hanging fruit, a land bank ordinance that is 98% done uh, that could be represented to council pretty quickly and launched. Um, and um, then I've got some uh, a few thoughts about um, the nexus of implementation, uh, policy and implementation, but that's, I mean, of course, that's once we've got a policy, that's 98% of the remaining work. So I guess that's where I'm coming from. Thank you. And last, I think the only other committee member um, who's on the call is John Sales. John, are, can you hear me? I can't see you. And you're muted. Well, let me see if I can. Sorry, I'm here and I'm like into like multiple different things at one time. So I'm listening but I'm not, very, I'm not doing a very good job of that. Okay. John, all we're, all we're looking for right now is we're going around to committee members asking if there's a particular issue or two that uh, you want to flag for a deeper dive. We're going to consolidate that and whatever there's consensus on what we're going to talk about, we're going to devote our time. So are there any particular items in the draft housing strategy that, um, that you would vote for us uh, focusing on today? I'm most interested in the uh, land bank, land trust model and having that discussion. Okay. And I believe that's all for the committee members, except for me. And I would, um, um, I would second, there are two that seem that have come up more than others. Um, so there's uh, more conversation about home ownership slash shared equity. So there were four votes for that. I would add a fifth for that. Uh, land bank, cost of land, there were three, I would add a fourth vote to that. Uh, the other one getting a couple of different votes was looking specifically about funding and implementation in the IAT. Um, so those seem to be the ones that, um, uh, those seem to be the ones where there's um, the most consensus on. And I would think that if we could handle three or four, we will have done something. Um, did I, I don't want to over summarize. Did I miss anything? Erin, are you raising? Um, just one member of the audience has their hand raised. So I, do you want to let them speak real quick or do you want to wait? Um, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay, this is Councillor Payne. So you're going to have to unmute yourself. Hey, no, um, put me in the audience for some reason, but um, I would just second um, the land trust and land bank. Um, that's really important priorities. It's probably deeper than we can get into today, but I think the funding is also a really important question, especially in light of our budget challenges. And um, given the election results in the Senate, I also think uh, the likelihood of additional money from the federal government is probably a lot lower. And I think that's just going to be a really complex and important question of how do we make these upcoming budget cycles work for affordable housing given the challenges of our budget situation. 
Thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. So again, I'm hearing consensus around three items, um, homeownership, shared equity, uh, funding, uh, and land. Um, does that sort of summarize where I think we can probably dig into all three of those today? Um, any objections to that before we jump in? All right, Ridge, do you have a preference for which one we should start with? No. Okay, well, let's jump into the one that got, the, well, the two got the most in votes, land and uh, home ownership wealth, um, since it's at the, literally at the top of my list. Um, let's, uh, let's talk about home ownership, shared wealth, and I'll open the floor to anybody. I think it was S. Lisa, Phil, Sunshine, a few others talked about that. Um, does anybody wanna sort of introduce their general ideas about that, things that they're concerned about, things that they like, things that, specifically with regard to home ownership, um, we should we should include, exclude, change. Yes, Lisa, do you want to do you want to start us off? You're muted. I can't tell if you're talking or not. I cannot unmute her. There's a technical difficulty over there. Would anybody else then like to start us off? So I'll sort of do a super top line. Um, and that would be that um, uh, I, and I'm not really prepared to discuss this in detail, I'd probably have to follow up with notes, but the mechanics of implementing that, um, of the recommendations of share of uh, the shared equity and the subsidies and the down payment assistance, I think that's probably worth a run through to sort of um, and sharpening a little bit as to what our options really are there and how they work. Um, I'm not really prepared to give a sort of a detailed run on it though. Um, but uh, the, the plan includes things like down payment assistance, how that's structured, who provides it, the sale of these properties under shared equity and all of it seems to be um, sort of a, a fairly closely uh, close uh, tight uh, pattern of, of, of buckshot, but I'd like to, to be able to sort of parse those a little bit in, in making specific recommendations on how that might or might not work. And I don't have anything sort of, I, I'm not sure I'm able to give sort of a chapter and verse rundown with having just raced through the plan. So I'm not terribly helpful, but there we are. Anybody else want to uh, tell us what particular that they, uh, where they would like to delve into in the realm of home ownership? I mean, one way to slice this is to use the form, the, the layout that's currently in the document and kind of go point by point or topic area by topic area. Gotcha. Um, and I would argue um, that if we're talking about um, home ownership and, and uh, land trust and so forth. The land bank is the first one that kind of comes up, but we can skip that uh, initially. And then it moves into down payment assistance and shared equity on page 112. Um, if it would be helpful, I can provide a, a little bit of additional background on that portion since obviously Piedmont housing is, is referenced there. Um, you want me to do a quick, would that be helpful or? Sure, uh, so I've shared page, can everyone see the shared screen? Yes. All right, so I've shared page 112 that you referred to. Um, yeah, go ahead, Sunshine. Okay, so the, 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 sh the long and short of it is that um, Piedmont Housing Alliance administers multiple down payment assistance funds. Um, one of them, the one that's referenced here is uh, related to city funds that the city has allocated historically. Uh, we also administer funds that Albemarle County has done so for the Albemarle County region, similarly for Louisa County. Um, we also administer funds uh, through the state. Um, and there are a couple of different programs, including direct down payment assistance, including uh, buying down interest rates uh, for the first mortgage. Uh, we also have our own uh, CDFI dollars, which we have utilized um, as well for down payment assistance. And I just want to highlight the part, there is a, there is a challenge in, um, well, on the one hand, I think it's 
uh, it's great that we have a multiple different resources. Each of them has their own particular requirements, limitations, opportunities based on the jurisdiction that created those funds. Um, so in the city of Charlottesville, even though what you're seeing there is accurate with regards to the city funds that have been deployed, we have utilized other funding sources within the city limits for also for down payment assistance, but that's not reflected here in the data because we're talking about specifically subsidy provided by the city. So I just wanna provide that as a little bit of a backdrop. Um, I agree with the recommendation that um, the one of the biggest challenges in the city, and we've seen a, a decrease in the number of down payment assistance loans we have been able to deploy in the city over the last few years. And that is largely driven by the increased cost of housing and uh, even with down payment assistance, the ability of uh, lower income ho households to purchase is just farther and farther out of reach without additional subsidy at play. Um, so I agree with the recommendation that um, the, uh, the cap go up to 20%. I agree with the recommendation that it's a 0% loan um, uh, because, and you're, are you moving to the next slide? So you'll know, yeah, on the, on the uh, recommendations, uh, make, uh, it's page 113, they, rec they recommend 20%, uh, up to allowable 20% towards the down payment assistance. Loans should be 0% with no payments. Um, the other recommendations uh, also make sense to me um, all the way through. So I think it, overall it's a, it's a decent framework and set of recommendations in my opinion. So I've flagged a couple of things to talk about. That's the, um, the specifics about down payment assistance and, um, and a specific suggestion um, uh, that the loan should be 0%. Um, anything else to bullet, Sunshine? I guess the, the one, the one uh, lingering question in their recommendations, um, if you look down on page 114, you'll see that they have a funding need of 60,000 per household. Um, so, you know, pre historically, uh, we have had a, a set, well, we still have what's called a revolving fund. So if somebody does sell their home who originally got down payment assistance, those funds theoretically come back into the fund, which we then redeploy to a, no, a new homeowner. Um, but because the increased cost of housing, the higher value of the loans we've been putting out there. Um, we have not seen funds come back. So there is need for additional funding to really be able to, to utilize this program in the future. Um, so that's all I'll say. Thanks. Uh, anybody else who commented, who wanted to talk about home ownership, are there any particular elements of the plan that you want us to dig into specifically regarding home ownership? Uh, if I may, I've got a question for, for Sunshine on this, but also in, in general. Um, and this harkens back to something we took a stab at for an employee down payment assistance program. Um, this 60,000 per household, if we wanna crank those numbers, even at 10, even if we're allocating $10 million a year, that's gonna start, um, that's gonna start taking a bite out of that number pretty quickly if we are successful. Um, and the more successful we get, the more the, the more it's, we're going to be robbing some Peters to pay some Pauls on this. And it occurs to me that um, I cannot think of a reason offhand where we might not want to encumber, uh, incorporate into one of these entities uh, a self-insured, self-funding mortgage insurance plan so that we can go get the financing and, and offer very cheap, uh, extremely cheap, sort of self-insurance on mortgage insurance. As a, uh, as a public entity, we're, we can be pretty flexible with that. And the, 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 uh, the securitized mortgage market will accept it. And that's a very cheap, relatively cheap way to use somebody else's money, provided that we have a premium structure that is helpful to the, helpful to the borrower or down payment. And we can do that either through a single premium plan or, or very discounted monthlies. Uh, in partnership with one of the big players. We had looked at that for the down payment assistance. I don't can't think of a reason why that doesn't work and it might allow for smaller down payment assist and then a very cheap mortgage insurance, which would eventually go away with equity and solve, you know, 
anyway, something to throw into the mix. Thanks. So, S. Lisa, are you back with us? I can't tell. So, I want, let me, let me, I want to respond to one thing that Phil started at the beginning, which is um, he's absolutely right that the more successful we are in terms of deploying those funds and supporting affordable home ownership, the more it costs <laughs> because it's a certain amount per unit uh, per house. Um, but at the same time, this ties in a little bit to the uh, idea of community land trust or other subsidized housing models, where if there are is additional, if there is subsidy that can be brought to bear at the front cost of those housing units, the need for a high amount of uh, down payment assistance loan drops. So if we can utilize state housing trust fund dollars, federal home loan bank dollars to subsidize the housing in the first place, the need for down payment assistance reduces. So there's a coupling there that is that it is a win-win potentially. Okay, uh, Ridge, you also talked about um, wealth building and equity. Do you want to tell us um, what in particular you'd like a, you'd like to be addressed in the in the plan? Yep. So um, very interested in, in shared equity models and going beyond just down payment assistance to a, a kind of a second mortgage type assistance, which could be employer funded. And I think there's a lot of of opportunity there. It's done in other parts of the country and we could, it could be done here. Uh, so more in employer assisted housing. My overall you know, focus on home ownership is, is in terms of wealth building and you know, the, the enormous, enormous racial wealth gap is explained at least in part by the lack of access to home ownership of people of color. And the Pew Charitable Trust says that, you know, the racial wealth gap is 13 times, you know, greater for white families than black families. But at the heart, at the, at the start of the racial wealth gap is the racial income gap. And we talk about the need for more subsidy um, the need for subsidy reduces if the income of the home buyer increases. And so I just continue to assert that we need to simultaneously be working with people moving them up the income ladder if we are going to move them up the uh, home ownership and, and housing ladder. And I just think it's a big gap in this report. But um, the last thing I'll say about shared equity is on page 44 of the plan, they talk about liens on, um, on properties that get assistance, um, which, is a, which is a fairly standard tool that is used, um, which is you, you, you help people buy a home that is affordable and then you put a lien on it so that it can always remain affordable. But what that does is it, uh, it, it eliminates the ability for that home buyer to get the benefit of the wealth that is created from that home if there's a lien or a, a restriction on the amount of sale, the sale price. And so I wanna see a, a home ownership program that allows people to benefit from the upside of, of property values increasing because that's how wealth is generated. And, and there's a tension, but there's a lot, there are a lot of studies that say that you're better off focusing on, on the second mortgage, uh, filling the gap of affordability rather than placing a limit on the, the value of the property that is purchased with, um, with, with, with uh, government funds. And so I would rather err on the side of letting that home buyer take as much advantage as possible of the, the value increases as opposed to just locking them out of that, that value gain. I would, I would strongly agree with that. Those were some of the notes that I had written down. Obviously home ownership is something that, um, that I think about a lot uh, in, my, in my day job. Um, but I, would, I wanna sort of echo and strengthen perhaps a couple of things that Ridge said. One is this um, uh, equity is written all over this uh, document, but I, I think there's, it's only very loosely um, the idea of home equity um, being equity. It's just a very loose and um, not um, a strong enough uh, in the document. And so, I mean, I would, I would like to see the document be a little bit more clearer about home equity and the racial wealth gap uh, in Charlottesville. Now, as that uh, and as as that's impacted by policy, um, I find that the that this is very very prescriptive about home ownership models, and I'm with Ridge. I strongly object to full stop uh, the down payment assistance being an unforgivable loan um, uh, that is uh, collateralized or backed by a lien. 
because as Ridge says, you're not allowing a family to take advantage of that wealth. They can't take a loan against something that has the lien on it. Um, um, and over time, they're investing in that home and they're not essentially getting any of that value. So perhaps uh, that language needs to be softened, that there are um, affordability provisions that last a certain amount of time, or if there is a deferred loan, it is forgivable over a period of time, um, or there's some other way to skin the cat. But I, I see this being um, homeownership, the only prescriptions in this document are homeownership light. Um, and if the problem that we're trying to address, and I think the study does it, or the, the draft strategy does a good job saying we're trying to address uh, hundreds of years of, 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 of racism uh, and, um, and in access to wealth among people of color in our community, uh, we need to take those, we need to soften those guardrails. Um, um, the other thing too, is I'm looking on page 43 that I have up on the screen and it implies that the only people um, who we should be targeting home ownership to are people above 40% of area median income. Uh, and I strongly object to that. Uh, we serve people at 25% and below or 25% above area median income. We actually bring people into the program to Ridge's point at 15% of area median income. And then we work with them to get their incomes up to 25 or 30%. The average uh, AMI of people in our program is 32%. Uh, and if we're really trying to use the housing strategy to address bigger sociological, socioeconomic inequities, we have to push those subsidies down and we have to give people at lower incomes opportunities to, um, to earn wealth or we're just repeating the same cycles. So I would strongly urge uh, that chart on 43 to be changed. I would also add that the, um, the only three uh, programs that are suggested as, you know, as uh, stimulating down or home ownership among low wealth people are DPA, owner occupied rehab and single family infill. I think that misses out on a lot of opportunity. Things like um, uh, land trusts, like uh, creation of land trusts um, or uh, section eight homeowner, use of section eight vouchers for home ownership or other kinds of land subsidies, other kinds of deeper subsidies. So I think it really misses the mark on that. Um, comments? So, this is Chris, uh, Chris Meyer. Ahead, Chris. Sorry, real quick. So page 113, if I'm reading the DPA correctly and shared equity ownership, is that where there are the specifics of the recommended changes? That's how I understood. My again review of the document is that's where that's at. Just getting to the, the question on you know building wealth and equity. It's the second bullet point here says, all right, down, provide down payment assistance in the form of loans that are zero percent interest, which I think is again aligned with what Ridge and Danny just mentioned. Um, but it does say not forgive. So again, I guess in my sense is that a lien is placed on the house for that amount of, let's say $50,000 in down payment assistance, right? If the house appreciates from 350, let's say to 400,000 because of the work the homeowner does time, et cetera, et cetera, the homeowner is still getting that $50,000 of appreciation, right? Depends on how it's structured, but, but presumably in most situations, yes. Okay, so I, I do think at least how they're present, presenting it in this document, it is allowing for capturing of that additional wealth, right? It's capturing some of them. So if you imagine what a family puts into it via a first mortgage, they get back what they put in. When they sell the house, they get back what they put into it. They also get the appreciation um, uh, over and above the initial cost of the home. Right. If, if we're talking about DPA being... $60,000 or $80,000 or, or $50,000 or $40,000. That's a big chunk of, of, the, of the value of the home that, that they never have access to. And a family could own this home for 50 years. And so I think what, um, and in addition to that, um, one of the, uh, the benefits of home ownership is that you can take loans out against the value of the equity in your home. But if you have a lien on uh, some of the equity in your home, 
um, you, you can't take out that loan. The, the, your, 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 the concern is the ability to take, again, further equity out of your house, uh, but you can't because there's a lien for a, a chunk of it. So not to sound like a broken record on this point, but instead of providing down payment assistance with a lien in all cases, it might be much cheaper, much more flexible and to the to the homeowner's benefit to have a guarantee um, uh, program that is essentially, you know, mortgage, uh, for lack of a better term, mortgage insurance is paid for by the city. So that's much cheaper. Um, the city can pay it or can, you know, subsidize it very heavily to the, to the owner. They get the benefit of the, all of the accumulation of the equity. Um, and, uh, the city or other funds are not popping out 60 grand a pop. It's more like, you know, um, 600 or $700 a year, which is a lot more sustainable. Um, you just have to be able to price it. Uh, I mean, one of the challenges is, is having the bar, the homeowner in a position that they can afford the full mortgage payment, but you know it might work out net cheaper to say we're providing down payment assistance for ten percent and guaranteeing the loan to the lender through either a guarantee fee arrangement or a mortgage insurance premium arrangement. That'll be a much higher leveraged use of bar of dollars and provide for um, more equity and. Um, so I think what we're circling around here is that there are a number of tools that are mentioned here, but the way this comes across is very specific. This is the home ownership program where Phil is suggesting that, that perhaps just a guarantee on PMI could save a family 20% without having to encumber uh, any of the equity in the home. So my suggestion would be is that because we've got a couple of other issues to talk about that um, uh, is that we make a suggestion that says, look, let's open up, e either let's make this more general, that we need to come up with a suite of tools to aid in low income home ownership, or we actually come up with a, with a, with a, with a um, um, bigger toolbox. Because again, this is very restrictive. This is, this is a program, one program that's, that, um, but it, but there are lots of other different ways to create home ownership that probably provide, or that certainly provide better equity and better access to that equity to low income families. Before we move, before we move on, um, I do think that there is a, there's the, we, we, where the conversation right now is kind of layering multiple, um, multiple priorities and multiple analyses. And I'm worried that um, it's, it's easy to kind of lay them all together and conflate them. And I think one of the, one of the ones philosophically speaking that I think we have not contended with, and I want to, I want to push back a little bit on what Ridge and, and Dan have shared is that of course, on the one hand, of course, access to wealth creation through home ownership, that's the quote unquote American dream. Like that's, that's, that is the me mechanism that, uh, uh, that white households in particular, but households in general have created wealth over time. The, the, not the counterpoint, but the other sort of simultaneous truth is that um, we are also trying to balance uh, on some level, I believe, and there's reference to it in the document, I think, I think we would all agree that there is, there is also this concern around gentrification and, and maintaining long-term affordability in uh, particularly in existing neighborhoods. And if the, simple, if, the, if the only model is a model where um, there is effectively um, an unconstrained opportunity to participate in the traditional home ownership market, then it's true that for that particular family who purchases a home and potentially creates wealth, that that family ideally gets benefit out of that. But from a holistic perspective, if our goal is also to ensure that we have neighborhoods that are um, multi-generational, multi-income, um, and ensure price points of affordability and uh, integrated throughout each neighborhood, simple, the un simple unconstrained model doesn't solve that issue. Um, where a model like a community land trust model where there is essentially permanent affordable home ownership opportunities embedded within neighborhoods uh, begins to be one tool set to address that. 
The other point that I want to highlight is it's also easy to look at the value that a single that a, a single family can gain through home ownership pathway, but it's not as simple in as the point of purchase. Um, if you look at the data over the last number of decades, every time there has been a major financial crisis, any of the gains in particular that Black families have accrued uh, through home ownership uh, have been largely wiped out in each of the, you know, in the 2008 crisis, the impact on home ownership loss for, community, for communities of color uh, was far higher and disproportionate compared to white families. Just having access to the traditional market without some ways of preventing and mitigating those risks into the future, um, I think is, we have to be really careful about. And I know this gets, it's a very nuanced conversation and I know that there's more dialogue this, which we don't have time for now. Um, but I just want to be sure we are being thoughtful about the holistic spectrum in that regard. Yeah, I don't disagree. I, and I, uh, I don't see that as pushback. I, I see that as actually reflecting where I think the conversation's going is that this is a, that this prioritizes a permanent affordability model, but that there probably needs to be a spectrum um, where there's a continuum of wealth building opportunities and uh, opportunities to invest in long-term affordability. And I, I don't think that there's any, I think we can write that up if that's com if you're comfortable with that. Can I dive in here, um, Dan, before my internet goes out or some other crazy thing happens? Of course. <laughs> uh, um, I came back um, when you were talking about um, increasing the tools for home ownership. I definitely 100% believe that there are multiple um, ways to create home ownership, um, especially looking at subsidies. And I truly um, am against um, simply just having a great focus on redeveloping public housing. I think that that is a model that truly needs to be rethought of. And um, Sunshine talked about um, people of color being the most vulnerable during um, troubling times, such as during the Great Recession. That also is was greatly due to subprime loans. There's a lot of variables that happened with that. So um, you can work constructively to make sure that we're putting families in the proper um, loans and making sure we're setting them up for success. Home ownership needs to be a greater um, priority than what it is right now in this, um, in this um, draft, as I would call it, as this draft. And if we're going to create equity, inclusion, and diversity in all neighborhoods, then um, affordable housing, along the lines of home ownership, we need to be more creative in how we can do it. It is 100% possible. We just need to um, broaden that toolkit and add more tools besides um, down payment assistance. I stand with Dan in, in wanting to broaden that. I hope my point is coming across crystal clear because I'm concerned that we have a mission, we have a statement saying how we want to make sure we have racial equity when the plan actually questions that. It brings that to question for me. What is the true um, the factor? People, our citizens need to believe in this plan because they've all, they're have they already walking into this with a disbelief based on the history of redlining um, within this community. So we need to get it right this time. And equity truly needs to be a part of it. Not continuing plans because it's the cheapest way or it's the historical way. Now, people are in certain areas, historically African-American neighborhoods, because they were redlined that way. So let's keep that in focus. So I hope I'm coming across clear that home ownership needs to be a larger part of this. And I, I, I do you... have challenges with the land trust as well, because it, again, keeps um, certain individuals in certain neighborhoods. Equity is gained and rep proper representation is gained throughout our community when families are not just set in one location simply because of the cost of a house. We need to be more, more creative in our ideas about how those families have gotten there and how we can put them in different communities so they can have different views, different visions of how their life can be. Get out of generational poverty. 
We need to truly think about this. Stop thinking about how we're going to be best um, promoted in, in our certain positions and just dive into the larger goal and thinking outside the box. Home ownership is a big issue and we need to create wealth when the, within these families. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. I, I think, um, I think we're I think we're achieving something that's like consensus. You you put it much more clearly than than I've stammered through, as Lisa. But that's the idea that, and again, this maybe goes back to Sunshine's point that that what what maybe maybe the consensus is emerging that we see um, a limited toolbox suggested here that is a little bit um, skewed toward long term affordability and investment in the unit. Um, and, and it really needs to talk about a continuum of home ownership interventions or options uh, that, that, have, that create a balanced portfolio of equity gain versus long-term affordability. Is that in a really rough way sort of describe what we're talking about here? I think we can write this up and send it around um, with some more specific suggestions, but does anyone disagree with the, the basic tenor flavor of, of our conversation? in that i would just say it you can't you can't generate wealth if you're constraining wealth and I so would. the toolbox has got to be what what better tools can we use to let people benefit from the upside of home ownership not constrain them because they start off low wealth and so we're going to constrain their ability to build wealth in the future because that's the best we could think of that's right i totally agree ridge and i, I would just add i don't um I don't think this is in disagreement with anyone. Um, one of the ways I think about the land trust model is in shared equity is if we are expanding the amount of homeownership opportunities that exist through that tool, which I would think would be the case, um, individuals are still building wealth. And I think of it as it's opening up wealth building to people who could otherwise only be renting if we weren't utilizing that tool. And in addition, it's opening up the opportunity for wealth building for multiple generations of families. So I think we're all, you know, and I certainly agree that's not the only tool we need to be using, but I do think the land trust model, I, I really do view it as a way for more people to create more wealth um, and would, would just add in, you know, that's sort of how I think about it is it's people who would otherwise only be renting now have access to home ownership and wealth building because of the land being taken out of the purchase price of the home. Um, but again, certainly that's not the only tool that we're gonna need. It's not the only tool and how many families does it actually help in the long run? Is it um, helping the families that are most vulnerable? Um, I think similar along these lines. My question is, are, when we talk about building wealth, does it require the increase in cost of housing and housing prices going up? Because my concern is we, we, we balance and we push that up. Okay, we increase the wealth for a lot of people, but then we're also making it more expensive for a lot of low income people too. Because I mean, the rental prices will go up too as home prices go up also, right? Yeah, I mean, this gets, um, it, it gets sticky fast because it's not, because ideally the impact you are having and by you, I mean the implementers of these and uh, of these policies and programs are going to change the model under which it functions, right? So if you've got um, if there's the the impact on home pricing and values and the overall economics, if you have ten interventions, is negligible. If you have fifteen hundred. Uh, then you're actually impact, you're having a market impact. And I think that there are other tools that they all sort of come together on that, like soft density and the way, um, and the uh, land bank and land trust models that are going to have an impact there um, beyond just that individual family. And I think, yeah, so there are two things to keep in mind. Are you moving a, a household in, in, in one way or the other, or providing that opportunity? If yes, you know, obviously the answer we don't want that to be is yes, but does it have that larger impact uh, if we do it not once, not 10 times, but a thousand times? 
and then what that does to the overall housing market and how people look at housing and how it's priced and how it appreciates or not. So I'm going to, I'm going to, sorry to interrupt, Phil, I'm going to, I want to try to bring closure to this because there were three issues that people wanted to flag and we're halfway through our allotted time. Um, so mm -hmm. I think that uh, at the end, we'll make some assignments to get certain people to draft up um, uh, uh, some recommendations for each of these three. Uh, we'll circulate them so there'll be time to, to, to edit, to, to share opinions, that kind of thing before a final recommendation goes up. I want to move on to the second topic, which is funding. Um, um, I want to interrupt really quickly. There was one hand raised a couple minutes ago. Um, oh, oh, thanks, Aaron. I appreciate it. Really quickly, Elaine, did you still want to speak to the task, or not the task force, the committee? Elaine, you'll need to unmute yourself. Yeah, we should move on. Sorry, we, I can, I can, it sounds like that was become a protracted conversation if I comment on the last topic. Okay, thanks. Is there anybody else in the audience, and I'm sorry, I can't see people in the audience um, who would like to comment specifically about home ownership as it's uh, drafted in the plan? Is there anybody, Aaron, I can't see? Okay, if not, we'll no, go ahead and move on list. to funding. There were comments uh, specific to the $10 million annual um, uh, funding level. There are, commit, uh, there are comments about tying it to some sort of plan. I think Sunshine, you talked a little bit about nuance. So I'll open up the floor. I think Sunshine and Phil, and I can't remember the third person who, um, who, who brought up the funding question, um, but I'll open up the floor. Let, let me start with Sunshine. So uh, I went through the plan <clears throat> uh, section by section to look at the recommendations of the amount of dollars associated with each of the recommendations. Um, there are many that were, uh, you know, X number of dollars per unit or had a question mark. Um, so I'm gonna set those aside for the moment. But if you start with um, the assumption that 10% of the proposed $10 million is for administrative costs, which effectively is paying staff time to oversee this, that's 1 million. <clears throat> they have. 2 million recommended for property tax relief, 900,000, uh, assuming we maintain the same number of, of uh, CSRAP uh, city-based vouchers, that's $900,000 a year, plus the recommending $1 million in emergency assistance a year. So I, I wanna highlight that because of all the priorities that we're, we're talking about, of the 10 million, 5 million is already effectively spoken for in the recommendation. 1 million for admin, 2 million for property tax relief, 900,000, I'll round it off to a million for a moment to, for a cease wrap, and then 1 million for emergency assistance fund. So that leaves 5 million a year uh, for LIHTC leveraging, CRHA redevelopment, preservation, down payment assistance, soft density as, uh, um, uh, uh, incentive, and rehab costs. So. I just I wanted to highlight that in particular because 10 million initially seems like a big number, but what they, what the consultants have done is essentially wrap in some some things that we have not previously thought about under the umbrella of affordable housing, uh, like property tax relief, and put it all under one 10 million dollar umbrella. Whereas previously under the city budget, it was looked at and through a different set of lenses. Um, so I don't have. Do you have a page I, reference, Sunshine? Is there a, is, what, what chart are you specifically referring so to? I actually, it's not a chart. I had to go through the document page by page to pull those numbers together. Gotcha. So if you look, for example, uh, let's go to, um, I will start with uh, page 100, where you'll see at the bottom of that page for the subsidy, they're recommending uh, 40,000 per unit. Of course, the number of units is not defined, so that's a that's a question mark. And then, if you go down through the list of of additional subsidy related um, uh, impacts, public housing redevelopment, preservation fund, down payment assistance, etc., they list out their recommendation of funding needs for each one. 
And so if you look, let's just go to property tax relief, which is page, uh, page 121, you'll see that the recommendation is $2 million annually. So I went through each of the, of the and I, I don't think I missed anything, I may have, but I went through each of them, including the administration piece, which is not highlighted here under subsidies, but is, is highlighted under governance instead, I believe. The total 10 million has 5 million already pre-allocated to, as I mentioned, administrative costs, property tax relief, CSRAP, and emergency rental assistance. And then the remaining 5 million can be utilized for all the other priorities. Um, so I, I wanted to put that on the table for discussion. Thank you. I think that's a, that's a good starting point. Um, let's see what else is on the table around um, funding. Phil, do you want to jump in? So, um, to sort of piggyback on Sunshine and, and without digging too deeply into, into that, I mean, um, if this administrative cost, the preponderance of which is essentially expanded staff, I, I think there's a case to be made that that is operating budget for the city and let's stop calling that, you know, affordable housing funding or any part of that. And if we're gonna, that sounds like we're high, that, that sounds to me like we're hiring four, four full-time equivalents, uh, perhaps five, um, depending on how we split that. And if that's what we're doing, that's city, that's, that's an operating budget item, not enough funding for affordable housing. So we should be able to, if it, the number is 10 million, take that out, we're at 10 million. Um, so that would be, that would be my first. Um, the, beyond that, uh, again, how these are deployed in what proportion is, is gonna get pretty hairy pretty fast, um, depending on what gets, what can get deployed in what order. So, and I'm not sure I have a solution for that. It's just a comment. Okay. Um, anybody else? General comments about funding? I'll add a, a couple of things. Um, so for example, on page 39, um, where, uh, where it references targeting, Um, I, I, it, it talks about targeting uh, based on AMI, and I think that's one approach, but throughout the document, there, there are references to the housing ladder of opportunity. And I'm not quite sure that this, by targeting a certain amount to people at 80% of AMI, people at 60%, people at 40, I know the, the idea is that, that, that basically says if you're targeting somebody at 80% or below, that's home ownership, if you're targeting somebody at 30% or below, that's that's public housing or deeply affordable house, uh, rental housing or uh, su permanent supported housing. Um, and those, you know, those rules of thumb are mostly okay, but I don't think they're exactly right. So, you know, 80, many LIHTC deals are 80% and below very median income. Um, many uh, home ownership deals are 25% of very median income. So I would like to see funding talk specifically about uh, types of housing and types of housing um, um, financial structures, whether it's rental ownership, so permanent supported housing. Um, and um, you're, what you're saying is you're, you're this, this AMI linkage is, you're saying is a, could be, end up being a stalking horse basically for, if we're doing it at this level, this is about home ownership. If we're doing it about it's this other prong um, and that AMI may not, is not necessarily the best tool to figure that out. And it may obscure more than it assists in trying to figure out how this money gets pushed out. Yeah, I, I, I say you summed it up accurately. I, you, know, I, you had mentioned in the preliminary conversation earlier about tying funding to an overall plan like the IAT. And I noticed uh, as you did that the IAT didn't seem, I don't know, Sunshine, you read this thing through, did the IAT get mentioned in this at all? So actually, can we, on that note, I was gonna make a comment. Can you move to page 42? Sure. Um, 
And one, before we get into that, just one quick clarification. You mentioned, Dan, that LIHTC can subsidize up to 80% AMI. Under normal conditions, it's capped at 60%. It can only do 80% if it counterbalances with 40% units or deeper affordability. So there's a, there's a blend there. Um, in any case, the, when I looked at this diagram, and, and if you look at the middle of the page, you'll see the reference uh, to the allocation assumes that 10% of the funding is set aside for administrative costs, just to clarify where that reference is. Um, but if you look at this, they break out 1,250 units, you know, 30% AMI, et cetera. Um, and they've talked about how it's 4,100 units total. When I saw this, my big question mark was how did they calculate this? And then how does that relate to the IAT that was developed? Um, so I feel like that's a giant question mark over this slide is how they got to these numbers. And how does the IAT play a role? There is no, as far as I could tell, I did scrub through it this morning. There is no direct reference to the IAT document in, uh, in this document. Um, but obviously they did some calculations, but how did they get there? Okay, so there are a couple of issues on the floor and I'd love to, to weigh in, to have other committee members weigh in. So one is that 3 million of the 10 million has been set aside for administration and property tax relief. Um, both of which I'm not, I'm not sure either of those things are uh, any of the committee members find objectionable, although maybe I'm over speaking but, um, but those were mixing potentially operational expenses. Um, um, uh, 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 forbearance of revenue um, with capital funding. And so is there general agreement that the $10 million should be for capital funding and not for other, uh, not for administrative and or um, uh, essentially um, tax forbearance? I agree, Dan, that if you look at, if you stand back or get up to 60,000 feet and you say, you look at this and you say, how many, how many new home ownership opportunities is this creating? And then work your way down to the details. Um, and I, I just, I have trouble with a million dollars in administration. Um, it seems to me that that's excessive and should be, uh, any way possible should be pushed into uh, city operations. And that, that the issue here is land. You know, is, it, is, this going to, is this going to get more land available to um, create affordability? And I, I, you know, we can talk about land trusts and so forth, but um, I think that's the lens that I would, I would want to look through. The and then the other the other issue that's on the table yeah. is this idea of having a specific plan tied to something like the IAT. Sunshine, I'm sorry, you had your hand up and I talked. Well, I just two points of clarification. Um, a moment ago, Dan, you mentioned three million dollars, i.e., admin plus property tax relief being non-capital, you know, embedded within this plan. It's actually five million dollars as non-capital, because when you include admin, property tax relief, CSRAP and emergency rental assistance, none of those are capital focused. Mm -hmm. All of those are, they're all necessary. They're all important. There's no, I don't think anyone questions that, but we have to be clear about the other 5 million can then be used essentially for capital incentive in some way or another. Gotcha. Okay. No, thanks for the clarification. That's right. Yeah, we, I think we've always known that in rolling CSRAP into the um, housing fund and always been a little bit uncomfortable with that for a couple of reasons. One is it's really not a capital expense and comes out of the CIP, but two is that it does potentially put families at risk um, because it's a, because it's competing with other capital, with, with capital needs as opposed to being an operational expense. So I think that our report or our recommendation will certainly want to include separation of capital from, um, from other types of expenses uh, and $10 million towards capital. Um, what about- I, uh, Sorry, one last point. Sorry, yeah. and, I'll, and I'll be quiet. Yeah. Which is to say that um, the point that Chris Murray was just bringing up around uh, $1 million for admin, setting aside the dollar amount for a moment and where it comes from, um, I do wanna say that Personally, and I, I, I suspect this is shared by others, 
that we need to have an increased staff capacity at the city level focused around affordable housing. So I don't want our comments to come across that we don't uh, aren't supporting that aspect of the recommendation, um, uh, but that not that it comes out of the of, the, of this dollar amount. Yes, I and I think we need to be crystal clear. in our report. We need to be really clear about that, unless there's objection from other folks. I, I think the the consultants laid it out pretty well that to administer the ambitions of the city um, right now we're asking too much of the staff, and if we're going to be layering on more uh, 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 programming, um, we're going to need even more staff. And so. Is there any objection to including that as part of the recommendation provided it's not part of the capital fund? No, I just wanna make sure that we're not conflating um, non-capital with administrative because I think tenant-based choice assistance is an important part of the, of the strategy for, for getting people into housing, not just capital projects. And so I just don't wanna have administrative costs lumped in with CSRAP as if they're one thing and capital is something that's more desirable over here. I just don't, I want to make sure that the distinction is not made that way. Okay. I, and I think that it, it's, it can be sort of self-correcting because if we're assumption is correct, that this administrative cost is principally an expansion of staff uh, in both bodies and capacity and material to support staff, that that really is, that is a permanent change to the budget and operating costs of the city. And that really does go off when once you've made the decision, we're hiring full-time people for this purpose. Although that's a cost and an ongoing cost, that isn't something that you revisit the way you do allocations of affordable housing programs. They are hired, they're, they're on board. And it really does, once you've made that decision, they're sort of out of the equation of how we are budgeting affordable housing dollars, I think. And I think we just need to make that clear that okay. that goes away. And that, and then the other nine million, whether it's tax relief, capital improvement, or subsidies at various times, those all belong in the um, in that budgeting box. Uh, and how we portion it is something else entirely. Okay, so I see consensus emerging around this topic, and I hate to preempt it, but we only have forty five minutes left total. I also want to make sure that there's plenty of room for audience comment. And we have one whole other topic to cover, uh, which is land. Um, so does anyone want final word um, or want to sort of wrap up, summarize what they think this conversation has been? Uh, Dan, this is Chris. I, I, I don't, I mean, indulge me, sorry. But uh, I, I did, just the 10 million number, again, there wasn't, it seems like it's benchmarked and they mentioned in the plan that 10 million would be more than the average uh, size city that, if I understand things, and it was page, I think, 40, 41. Um, so I would say that that amount, total amount, whether it's capital and administrative, seems, again, we're already spending more than a comparable city at our size, seems about the right amount. It also seems to be focused in that sense also of leveraging ex external capital, which, uh, you know, whether it be state, local, federal funds, or, or private funds, which I think is important. Um, I, I did wonder, sorry, to, to, and I would like to think, and maybe we talk about how we pay for this is by increasing property taxes, which is listed as one of the many to, you know, ways they do. I don't know if our committee wants to come out and say, hey, we think property taxes should be raised. Um, you know, again, speaking about equity in this community and where a lot of the wealth is, which is in the land. And that's one of the things that the city actually can tax. Um, again, hmm. I, so... My preference would be that we, we also think about, or I would suggest to the committee that we talk about raising property taxes, you know, and, and, and in comparison then using the you know, property tax relief at the same time. Um, so it does not negatively impact the lower income folks, but then we are getting at and addressing some of those equity issues in this town and around wealth generation, which has benefited, you know, in specific communities. And uh, oh my, thanks. It's a kind of legal way to do progressive taxation. I, I know Lisa Robertson wouldn't want me to say that, but. <laughs> well, I would just quickly, I know we have to move on, but I think it's really important to look at the actual dollar amounts raised by raising different taxes um, at certain amounts, just because I think the property tax raises a lot less money than what you assume, especially when you consider that 
um, a large fraction of it that would be city revenue is going back into the rental relief program. And so I just don't, it's definitely something that can make, uh, get us closer there, but I don't think we should have any illusions that that alone is going to, especially in the COVID world, get us close to the ability to do that 10 million a year um, because the relevant revenue raised for each increase in that tax, I think is a lot let, lower than might be commonly assumed. All that not to say that it's not something that needs to be explored, but just Mike, look do you at have, it with your eyes. Mike, Michael, do you have preference for uh, for the taxes that, um, that that would go in as recommendations that are that are better um, than. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying it's better. The meals tax raises a lot more revenue. Um, obviously, the property tax you can combine it with some of that property tax relief, which makes it a little bit more progressive. But unfortunately, you know, the state of Virginia really limits what we can do on progressive taxation. So even there it's better than the other alternatives in terms of being more progressive, but we're not, we're still not at a point where you're able to evaluate it on, you know, the, 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 uh, you know, the income of the, the family or homeowner. Um, there may be new opportunities. I don't know how much revenue it will raise. I think there's new opportunities now with general assembly's legislation to do a tax on single use plastics, um, which is a potential new revenue source. I, again, I don't know how much that would raise. Um, at this point, you know, I wouldn't be able to say what is better or worse or, you know, what we'll need to consider, but just just to flag that it raises a little less re or a lot less revenue than might be assumed. I mean, it does seem to me that this is a place where this uh, draft is pretty robust. On page 41, it gives, what, 10 different types of taxes and or fees that could be directed toward housing fund. I, I'd be inclined to, to sort of support that. Um, Well, yeah, I mean, they do, uh, they don't dive deep, right? So, I mean, the question is, we don't know how many dollars come from each of these buckets. It's more of a suggestion of, you know, start dip, dip, start dipping your label, ladle into these buckets and see how much, you know, you can actually realistically pull. Gotcha. Okay, so I think we've got more or less consensus around this, at least enough to draft something up. Let's move on to the final topic that was flagged, and that's land. So a number of people flagged that. Um, uh, Chris, uh, you did. Phil, I think you did. Um, I'm not sure. I think somebody else did as well. Um, Chris, do you want to jump in? Um, it, at, the, at the highest level, they're not making any more land. And so um, we are competing with, um, with the private developers uh, for the same amount of land that's available. So the city, if the city has any land available, that's you know throwing that into the pot in one way or another, is a um, is an important element, um, and a land trust or land bank arrangement where you're where the um, you know it goes back to the down payment assistance and a lien on that, uh, that doesn't work. But land trust where you're sharing the equity with the with the uh, the homeowner. I think is a compromise that 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 has the most traction, but it's the scarcity of land that is the issue. And what can the city do about that? Are there specific elements of the draft that you wanted to that you wanted to address, Chris? Um, I, I I cannot. No. Okay. It, so, a question to those who may have read this more closely uh, than. Uh, I did, and I am going to go back and take a, a thorough dive at it. Was there, um, and this is a hobby horse I've gotten on before and around a bit, uh, but we do have a substantial chunk of dirt that's a little damp in the city, by which I mean that it is located uh, in the floodplain, and there are means of constructing on that that are, uh, that will uh, ensure and ensure that you're not setting folks up to have their houses swept away. Um, but that, that is one piece of land that falls into larger land use is to say regulations for how we can build, you know, what we can put on stilts in the floodplain and on what, uh, under what circumstances. If not for residential housing, maybe for other uses to take pressure off land, uh, you know, otherwise. 
just as just as a I, I know just sort of as a throwing a throwing a dart at the at the possible uses. Okay. Other general comments about land uh, as it pertains to this particular draft. And I think a uh, much greater detail on the soft density piece. I mean, I think that's worth exploring a lot too. Do you have specifics still? Um, just that I'd like to see what the modeling on that looks like and what sort of comparisons we can make for, um, and I do think they cited a couple of case studies, which in my uh, review this morning, I didn't read, uh, but uh, to take a, you know, what is the impact of soft density uh, and in terms of the real costs, um, you know, if we're talking about family housing, triplexes on a big lot are, uh, seems to work out better than a single family on a smaller lot. Yeah, I mean, my perspective on that, Phil, is that this is pretty good about uh, recommending allowances for soft density pretty much everywhere in a pretty dramatic way. What it doesn't do is talk about advantaging um, soft density for affordable yeah, that was housing my point. much. It, it's a sort of buy right allowance where my recommendation would be stronger to be stronger on the language of um, of uh, a buy right affordable soft density rather than simply buy right soft density because they also um, made a point of debunking the idea that simply adding inventory is going to appreciably appreciably bring down uh, costs. Look at a place like Palo Alto where they just build four million dollar homes on a lot on a small lot um, and you don't get affordability there. Um, so I would uh, strongly recommend that under land, uh, we recommend that, um, that, that we sort of add, that we add affordable between buy right and soft density. So buy right affordable soft density, which, which I believe you could, under the, the new enabling legislation, we could write into our zoning code um, uh, without a whole heck of a lot of limitation. As far as I can tell. I would like to echo a version of that. Sorry, I have an echo here. Uh, I would like to echo a version of that in particular, um, in part, just recognizing, you know, experience in Austin where similar to Charlottesville, there was massive, um, you know, growth, more, more so in Austin than here, but still the growth outpaces the development by a wide margin. So we have, there's no way to, to effectively catch up um, and, and balance the supply demand equation on some level. Um, we can ideally make some, some long-term difference in terms of, of mitigating that and minimizing the impact of it to some extent, but we'll never catch up because of the landlock uh, situation and, the, and the, the cachet of the city and people wanting to move here. Um, so on some level, we, we, we sort of have to look at this as an equation of both, you know, getting as much built as we can on some level but on the other hand we're just going to have to subsidize it on some level too like there's it's no ifs ands or buts about it and and i would just like to 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 expand our thinking on when we talk about subsidy is subsidy just to in, in think about uh, making housing more affordable subsidy could come from taxpayer dollars that are offsetting the increasing costs but subsidy could also come from income gains from working people who now have more money to put into their housing. And I just think it is a huge missed opportunity not to think about helping people move up the income ladder as part and parcel of a housing strategy. And it, it, it isn't something that I would amend in the document that we have it's something that I would say, and I'm not, I'm not asking for more money. I think there's just got to be a recognition that there are two sides of the equation, the cost of the housing and the amount of money that somebody has to put toward their housing. And we should be as focused on that second part as we are on the first part, as part of a housing strategy. So I think what you're getting at is something I've always sort of thought that there were two overlapping or overlaying mental models around housing. One is the housing ladder. And if you think about that, a housing ladder at, at you know one end is is emergency transitional housing, and the other is home ownership and market rate and everything and all gradations in between. But then there's a value chain 
that bolsters all of those things. And that has to do with things like transportation and income and access to credit and whatnot. And um, so I do think that this is more about the housing ladder than it is the value chain. And so what do you think, Ridge? I mean, do you think we wanna have, recommend some explicit reference to what I'm calling the value chain, but could call it anything else, the sort of the, the, the supplemental supports that allow people to, um, to move up the ladder? Yes, and, and I think it, it goes to the very heart of the question, which is uh, this affordable housing, housing plan really does make it seem like low incomeness is a constant that must be worked around rather than a variable that could be changed. And, and it just is gonna require a different way of thinking and um, it has implications, um, it, it, anyway, I'll, I'll stop there, but, but you know, in, the, in the previous housing needs assessment, there was an explicit rec recognition that helping the citizens of our community climb up the income ladder was an, an integral part of addressing our affordable housing crisis. I think the similar, it, it needs to be similarly referenced here um, so that we can expand our thinking about what it means to help people afford their housing. Look, um, Rid, I've mentioned this before. You go back to 1961 when the city of Charlottesville was organizing its uh, housing redevelopment authority, its housing authority, and trying to stand it up. And the consultant, one of the consultants that was brought in for the organizational piece, made an explicit statement. Charlottesville, Virginia does not have a housing problem nearly so much as it has an income problem. And we're still having that conversation 60 years later, but it doesn't yep. and only and, because we haven't addressed the problem, frankly. Yep. And just quickly on that, on in terms of equity, the struggle of low incomeness is not equally shared across our community when 54% of black families make less than $35,000 a year while it's only 13% of white families. So there's an equity part of the income gain that makes home ownership more possible, et cetera, that, that I just think has to be acknowledged more explicitly here. So I'm gonna suggest this. So we're at an hour and a half. Um, I think a bunch of us were up all night last night or much of the night last night. I think we have some good notes. And what I would like to do is offline uh, cajole um, individuals to draft up sections of this recommendation. Um, I don't want to do it here publicly because I want to give people an opportunity to say no, frankly, I don't want to publicly shame folks. Uh, so with y'all's permission, I'll, I'll do that and include it, I think, this whole idea because it wasn't one of the topics that we recommended as one of the highest priority, but it's, it's shown up in all of these, this idea of um, uh, that Ridge was just speaking about the idea that low incomeness and low wealth should not be a permanent, um, you know, it's it. That's not what we're getting. That's not what we're hoping is to create stasis around that. But um, uh, and housing and income and the ability to climb the ladder are connected. So uh, I will be assigning or asking somebody to take on that, and I think y'all can probably guess who I'm going to be asking to do that. But. <laughs> public I just want to make this one comment about public housing. Public housing should be temporary. It should never be generational. It should never be something that we depend on to house um, families, especially um, families of color specifically, who are seem to be more susceptible to just remaining in public housing, which is why for equity purposes, home ownership needs to be a bigger part of this and thinking outside the box. Stop putting, um, for lack of a better way to say it, a master's tool to, um, to deconstruct the master's house. So think outside the box. This is hard work. Nobody said it was going to be easy and some people's feelings are going to get hurt. But I am, I am for equity, inclusion, and diversity in home ownership. And that may mean blowing up some of the systems that we currently have. So dive deep, be creative, recreate the toolbox of affordable housing. So, so Lisa, I, I agree with all that. Are you think, do you think we're being else, thinking outside of the box here? Or, no, I don't. You don't. I don't so I guess the thing is- Enough, what, no. Okay. So, what if I, if I may, and I'm, what do you would say 
are we lacking? What would we should be including and suggesting that would be thinking out of the box? Well, I mean, um, I would say, and this is my opinion. I'm not representing anybody particular. I'm just saying me. There should be less emphasis on um, public housing, redeveloping public housing, and how can there be greater emphasis on that ladder of opportunity? It should be temporary. If you're getting funds for this, um, from the system, where is your strategy out of public housing into home ownership that truly builds that wealth gap, that truly gives families um, opportunities in home ownership? It was done in the 30s. It can be done now. So, if I can so be creative, I, I, use those subsidies in different ways. There are programs out there that already allow for home ownership through subsidies. So, so Lisa, sorry if I'm, I, I completely agree with you that public housing should be temporary and I would. But it's uh, not, it's, it's generational. I, I agree, but I think having an explicit statement, like you're saying that somewhere in this document, if it's not there already, would, should be important, uh, if I understand. And, and to getting, I think, to what you're trying to say, maybe I suggest, uh, is that we should be trying to prioritize maybe those who are in public housing, getting them targeting the subsidies, et cetera, to help them get into these, you know, out of it and into the home ownership. Yes. I mean, a mother who starts in public housing should not have her grandchild coming into public housing. Okay. Did, but well, I think, I, I think that that, I mean, that integra integrates the whole idea of, a, of an overall strategy that the, that subsidized public housing has its place. Um, and, the sort of argument that it should be as transitional as we can reasonably make it. Having said that, if we're going to talk about outside the box thinking, um, we need to have the tools to be able to do that, which is an awkward segue since we're supposed to be, since we wanted to talk about land use just a little bit, that um, one of the recommendations they make about the land bank is that it's a three to five year lift and i would suggest that that's a that if we're going to make some movements fast that we do that first and we have a land bank ordinance that's 95 percent 98 percent written that's already been blessed by one council that we might as well dust it off and get it launched because if we're going to start subsidizing land purchases and looking at for example perhaps uh, a trust arrangement of a large number of uh, leasehold buildings, which is one way to get around our land cost problem for folks, uh, which is uh, which are tools that are basically available now. We just have to create the environment for them. But that's something we need to stand up now, not later. Uh, and if we want to start looking at things like land banking, land trust, the, the tools that we can bring to bear, that putting them three and five years out is not going to move the ball at the pace we want to move it. All right, so I'm going to um, thank you. I think we're, um, I think we've made a lot of headway today. Um, again, what I'm, my plan is to um, maybe write up these notes, or at least as I have them, and then um, ask people to take on a portion of this. We have to turn this around quickly. Um, we have until the 10th. And so, um, what's that next Monday or next Tuesday? Okay. So um, um, probably uh, I'll be asking people to turn around a draft by the end of the week. So we have a couple of days to circulate it and then get it out in formal form. Before we move on to that, uh, I want to open it up. Aaron, is there anybody in the audience who would like to comment on anything that we've spoken about so far or anything else having to do with the um, draft housing strategy? Yeah, Elaine? there's one hand or two hands raised. Um, Elaine, I'm going to call on you first. Hey, um, I hope that this comes out correctly because I have been up since four in the morning yesterday, um, pull watching and doing things and freaking out. So uh, forgive me if this is, uh, this is a public meeting. This is a city um kind of uh, sanctioned meeting. So I, I have to just address the comments about public housing um, and, and they're related to Ridge's comments. I agree that this is a bigger problem and coming from an organization that tries to address the problem holistically, um, you know, 
<laughs> when I say holistically, I mean like the income ladder, right? We regularly sue people for wage theft. We regularly fight for a higher minimum wage. Um, and we're not, all of these problems are just not going to be solved overnight and we cannot find a silver bullet. Um, the need for public housing is great. And the reason is because the systems are so embedded in this country. When I say systems, I mean, you know, like the wage issues, like the mass incarceration issues, all of these things are linked to force people to stay in public housing. Yes, I think most of the families that we work with do not want to be there intergenerally, intergenerationally. But you know what? It is a necessary haven for people at the same time so that they can work on those other issues like the education gap, like all of these issues that we're talking about. Um, I want to encourage us not to kind of jump for that silver bullet and kind of highlight what Sunshine said. When you think about home ownership and how we got into the foreclosure crisis and what one activist calls one of the greatest equity thefts of black home ownership in this country, it wasn't just because of targeted predatory racist loans. It was actually spawned by George W. Bush, very well-intentioned effort to increase home ownership access. And it opened the door for subprime mortgage loans. It opened the door for securitization of mortgages. And I just want to caution, you know, you all as a public body to be very careful about trying to find that silver bullet and abandoning tried and true places for funding like Friendship Court, like, like subsidized housing, Section 8 programs, the programs that have been working even though they're terribly underfunded and sometimes don't work because of the underfunding. Um, and so I just, I just want to push back and say, you know, public and subsidized housing still has to be a core of what we move forward with. And we need to be very careful with how we throw around, you know, homeownership like as a silver bullet. Homeownership is super important, um, but as someone who litigated those foreclosure cases throughout that generation, like we just have to be careful. That's all. Thank you, Elaine. Well said. Appreciate it. Aaron, does anyone else have their hand up? There is one more hand raised. Mr. Kenneth Martin, you're on with the committee. You'll have to unmute yourself. I'm unmuted, I hope. Yes. We can hear you. All right. I don't normally speak off the cuff, but I was very impressed with, and I have very poor vision, so I'm not sure what her name is, but it's S. Lisa Herndon, I think. Correct. Uh, all right. With her remarks, and uh, it, it, it resonated with me about... It's particularly about subsidized low-income housing. And I would like for you, while you can deliberate, is to make sure that you're not making recommendations that will continue the segregation that we have had here since we've opened up. And I was born here in 1948, so I was here before public housing opened. I was here before Friendship Court or Garrett Square, whatever it was, opened and, and that. And what I have noticed with Charlottesville in particular is that it feels extremely comfortable with all forms of segregation. And I've said that in many places, and I'll say it to you, and I plan on saying it to, again, to city council and others, and that we have used housing for segregation. So when I hear the word gentrification, I think about people using the word gentrification, not in this particular instance among this group, but historically, is to say that we do not want a mixed income moving into certain neighborhoods and that we are going to reserve those neighborhoods for certain income people, which is a reservation. It sets up concentration camps. It sets up ghettos and plantationism. 
And right now what we are doing with our so-called redeveloping of our low income housing is that we are concentrating even a greater degree of poverty in one area. For example, we are tripling that at Garrett Square, we are going to double it, uh, more than double it on South First Street. And uh, 6th Street goes from 25 units to 106 units is in the plan. So although we are using the rhetoric of saying that we are providing housing for people, what we are doing is perpetuating the history of segregation here in Charlottesville. I'm not interested in what goes on in Palo Alto or San Francisco or New York. We need to address the situation here in the city of Charlottesville. And I just wanted to say that uh, Ms. Herndon's opinions resonated very well with mine. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. We really appreciate your words. Is there anybody else, Aaron, who has their hand up? If there's anyone else in the audience who would like to speak with the committee, feel free to raise your hand. At this time, no one else has their hand raised. Okay, well, I'd like to thank Aaron and Joe, Brenda, Alex, um, all staffers for supporting this. I know that it's in your busy day, it's not easy to support a meeting like this. So very much appreciate that. I wanna uh, thank committee members and members of the public uh, who sat through this. Uh, it was um, it's detailed, um, uh, I very much suggest to me the rationale for the hack and for the subcommittees of the hack to be able to take um, detailed um, policy prescriptions and break them down, express different opinions. Um, uh, bring out some sparks that have to be brought out in the community. Um, and um, I would hope that as this, pro I don't know exactly, I don't have a window into the future of the process with this draft, but I would hope that, that this committee and the hack in general would maybe have another opportunity or two um, to, to dive in or at least to meet with the consultants. I also hope, Aaron, will you share this recording with the consultants? Yes, I mean, the recording will be put up on the website so we can just share the link with them. Appreciate that. And so I promise you all that uh, staffers that um, we'll have something by way of a recommendation that has been drafted and um, circulated among this group uh, back to you by the, it sounds like the, it's the 10th the deadline, is that right? What's, Phil, what's driving that deadline? Maybe Alex. So driving, there's a we work session for on the 10th uh, to take a look at this draft by council. So the idea is, is that we have this available at that time. So that, that was my that was my target. And of course, subsequent to that work session, we will have, you know, the hack may have an opportunity to meet. Of course, November is always a little problematic, but. Alex, is there a time that, um, that you would prefer to have this uh, in order to get it to council? Well, whenever I think uh, before council um, <clears throat> uh, um, I would be fine. And then uh, once I get it, uh, if he's going to council, I will also send uh, a copy to the consultant. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, we'll endeavor to turn this around by, uh, by end of business on Monday. Is that, does that work for you, Alex? Yeah. Great. Okay, uh, thanks everybody. Get some rest, uh, take care of yourself today. Go out, have a walk, be nice to your neighbors. Um, thank you for joining us, take care. Thanks everybody. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you, Rich. Bye-bye.